We'll now have the question and answer session. We had requested that questions for both Reverend Flowers and Mr. Shavit be submitted in writing prior to this event. Questions were reviewed and selected by the steering committee. And I'd now like to call up Joel McGalnick, editor and publisher of the JT News, who will moderate this session. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Shavit, Reverend Flowers. Thank you. All right, as Keith said, we do have a, a list of questions here. Um, most of them are directed toward Ari, but we have a couple for you as well. I'm gonna start out, um, Mr. Shavit. What do you think a responsible American Jew who believes the current right-wing government in Israel is committed to seizing increasing amounts of Palestinian land with no intention of seeking a valid two-state solution should do to protest this government? First of all, what he should not do, he should not support BDS. <laughs> but there is a larger, there is a wider and larger point here. Any attempt to try to force Israel to do the right thing, so to speak, is in my mind, first of all, does not represent the spirit of peace and liberalism, but also would be very counterproductive for two reasons. One, it will probably fail, because once Israelis see forces closing in on them, they close ranks and they will not listen, and you will have exactly the opposite reaction. But two, say you have such huge forces that can break Israel's back, you don't want Israel's back to be broken. If you want to end, <laughs> if you want to end occupation, or you want peace, or you want whatever, you need a strong Israel there. And this goes right to the heart of the argument that I, I think we should bring back. Israel is our third and last attempt to save ourselves. If God forbid something will happen to Israel, there will be no fourth attempt. There will be no Jewish sovereignty there, and I'm afraid there won't be in a thriving non-Orthodox Jewish community here. We all need Israel. And I think that we should always, and parts of what we have to say in campuses and in Europe and everywhere, the world cannot take this risk again. They've done enough to us. It is not only a national issue, it's not a security issue. It's a moral issue. We are a small, endangered people. And I cannot understand anyone, I'm not talking about people who are vicious and just to pretend to be liberal and peace-loving. But the ones there who are attacking Israel so viciously, Israel's core existence, I'm not talking about its policies, their risk they are taking morally is un understandable. And in this sense, I think that it's time for us to really, again, and while I criticize the policies of my own government, and while I want change and peace and I'm willing to pay all the prices, we also have to look at the past. In 1967, when there wasn't one settlement and one checkpoint, we were about to be attacked by forces we thought were strong. They turned out not to be. And the world turned its back on us. Our only ally, France, betrayed us. In 1973, when we were attacked by Arab forces, not one European democracy enabled the Americans' planes to land while they were going to rescue us. Only the dictatorship in Portugal was willing to do that. 
So we must change the conversation. On the one hand, Israel must do the right thing. It must change its positioning, must change its policy, and must really capture the moral high ground. But at the same time, those viciously, those viciously attacking Israel should be reminded of the moral risk they are taking upon themselves. Because in no way, in no way, should Israel's future and existence be threatened again. Thank you. I'm going to actually move you over here because this is a question for both of you. I'll let you pass the microphone back to each other. Many in the United States support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement as a nonviolent alternative for supporting the peace process and the two-state solution. Since you both see BDS as a threat to Israel, and since many Israeli military, security, and intelligence experts believe that the occupation and the lack of a workable two-state solution is the greatest threat to Israel and fuels the BDS movement, what do you propose that concerned Americans can do to help end this conflict and support a future of hope for Israelis and for Palestinians? Well, first of all, uh, I think when you look at uh, this entire movement for a two-state solution, one way you can help is instead of divesting is to invest. The difference of divestment is investment. I think if uh, Americans, Jewish Americans, black Americans, white Americans, whomever, if we invest our time, our efforts, our monies, our energies, our resources, our minds, invest that in terms of dialoguing with both the Palestinians and the Israelis, that will help bring about a peaceful solution. When you stand on the other side and continue to uh, seek to destroy Israel and make Israel illegitimate, you only work to create a larger problem from my perspective. Uh, we believe in boycotts as well. Uh, the African American community, as you know, the civil rights movement was born through the Montgomery bus boycott, 381 days in Montgomery, Alabama. But as I stated earlier, boycotts must be scrutinized. And you have to understand, is it really a true boycott to get to achieve a common moral goal? Or is it a boycott really with a hidden agenda? And that is the destruction of the Jewish people. Yeah. I think there are two things that can be done. One, I think that we have to think in new creative ways about the peace process and how do we promote it. I have my own ideas. I do not want to impose them on, on you tonight. But I think that after three, four failed attempts to do it in the old way, we have to find new creative ways to bring about reasonable peace, not a perfect peace, to the Middle East and to Israel and Palestine. I think that we peaceniks have been intellectually lazy. For 20 years, we've seen the problem. It keep, we keep running into the wall, and we complain, why is the wall there? It's time to think afresh in a new way, and I think things can be done. But the other element is exactly the ultimate answer to BDS, because I know my fellow Israelis. Israelis talk about the fact they hate, they hate to be firing, they have to be suckers. But the truth of the matter is that there is nothing Israelis want more than love and warmth. Give the Israelis a hug, a real hug, and you'll be amazed by you get. And I'll give you two examples. The first one was King Hussein of Jordan. After we signed the peace agreement with, with, with with Jordan in 1994, I assure you, if King Hussein would have run in the Israeli elections, he would have won. <laughs> the Israelis were totally in love with him. But then there was a great American president. Bill Clinton demanded of Israelis to go back basically to the 67 lines, to give up 97% of the territories. 
And yet, because it was so clear to every Israeli that he cares about us, that he does us because he loves us, he would have won a landslide victory in Israel's elections. So try, rather than try the BDS ways, try love. It will work much better, and it rhymes with peace. All right, this question comes from someone who says, I am an American, a Zionist, and believe in the state of Israel 100%, but Israel has made bad decisions. After the 1967 war, when Israel won territory formerly held by other countries, why did that land not become part of Israel? Why do we say it's still in contention? Israel won this land in war. This is the way, works elsewhere, way war works elsewhere in the world. Why not in Israel? Well, I don't want to be considered stepping into foreign territory since I'm not Israeli and since I'm not Jewish. However, I would say that from my perspective as one who has been to Israel on six different occasions, who's had a relationship with the Jewish people for nearly 30 years now, going back to uh, my days with Coretta Scott King and others, I think that it is a very complex and complicated situation, first of all. As a pastor, a preacher, you'll look throughout the scriptures and you'll discover this conflict did not just start last year. It's been going on for many years. Uh, and from a biblical perspective, it goes all the way back to uh, Abraham, Ishmael, Abraham and Isaac, the whole conflict beginning way back when. And so it's a problem that is very complex, very uh, interesting in terms of swapping land for peace, whether or not you uh, actually have settlements or have other issues. So I think I would rather defer to Ari uh, to have him to tread in those uh, areas since he is Israeli and lives there every day on a regular basis. I, 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 w I would say the following is we don't want to get into a deep political discussion here. I think that the key is to understand that there are two things that are not acceptable from my point of view. On the one hand, ongoing occupation, and the other hand, ongoing intimidation. The, the general problem that we have in the discourse is that so many people folk in the left focus on occupation and overlook intimidation while so many people on the right focus on intimidation and overlook occupation. The way forward is to address both, to see reality and it's all its complexity. So on the one hand, Israel must be a real, in, it, it must make clear to itself, to its people, to its young people, but to Jews throughout the world and to the international community that it is doing everything it can in order to be a democracy like any other without having this burden that is endangering us morally, demographically, and politically. But on the other hand, we have to address the fact that previous attempts have failed, that Israelis have opened their hearts to, the, to peace, actually, three or four times, and every time it, turned to, it ended up with turmoil and violence. So we must address both issues, and we must find this new creative way, a kind of third way approach that will lead us forward on the ground, but will also change the dynamics concerning Israel throughout the world. And I think that can be done and must be done, because that will be the way to guarantee our future. Thank you. So as much as we're basking in the glow of the victory at the University of Washington in the past week, um, down the road in Olympia, our state capital, BDS has become entrenched in the Evergreen State College. And uh, the movement has really been spreading its propaganda there. 
Has Israel considered providing factual information about its necessary occupation of the territories and why Israel is not responsible for the living conditions of the Palestinians in those territories? Let's, let me put it this way. First of all, things, as I said, I'm, I'm so happy about the victory here, but there's life outside Washington State, and, 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 and we are challenged everywhere. We are challenged in a big way. I think that the basic solution, we cannot ignore two things. On the one hand, we cannot ignore Israel's mistakes and flaws, and on the other hand, we cannot ignore that the people out there, there are dark forces out there that want us, don't, don't want to end occupation. They want actually Israel to be abolished and possibly destroyed or dismantled. And there is a big difference. If you make the, I don't accept the comparison between Israeli occupation, the West Bank, and the Algier War. But even if you take that comparison, when people throughout the world and in France demanded that France will get out of Algier and will end its, its occupation of that country, no one, no one questions France's own legitimacy. No one said France is not legitimate. They opposed French policy and French behavior and French actions. So the key, the key again is to make this very clear distinction. Only if we will get the total legitimacy for our existence there as a Jewish democratic state, only if we will know that the world will not betray us after we take the risks we are asked to take, only then can we actually move forward and do what people expect us to do. So I think that there is no way for us to ignore the problem. There is a real problem. But the way forward is to combine the two. On the one hand, let Israel take real steps on the ground that change the dynamics. We must create two-state dynamics in, in the real reality that will lead to creation of a kind of two-state state that will eventually lead to a two-state solution. We must prove to ourselves and to the world that we really mean it, that we are not just playing games. But once we do that, we should not be naive. We should use that opportunity in order to go on this massive offensive, massive offensive that is needed in American campuses and elsewhere. We should take whatever steps we'll take there in order to create this new narrative and this new approach towards Israel. So we must combine any concessions on the ground with this new and forceful fight to prove to everybody how just and moral Israel is. Thank you. There are some people who suggest that a major disincentive for Israel to come up with a comprehensive peace plan is the polarization of Israeli society between the secular and the ultra-Orthodox. Can Israel agree to a comprehensive and mutually agreeable peace plan with Palestinians without first addressing this internal divide? Well, you know, it's, it's difficult being a Jew. It's even more difficult being a Jewish Israeli. You know, we are faced with many challenges, and we have to deal with them all. We cannot, we have, you know, unlike many males, we have to do several things at once. <laughs> and, and, and so, yes, definitely we have to deal with internal divisions within Israel. I am actually cautiously optimistic. I think that although we have deep divides, I think, and we will not get into it, that there is, there is a will and a wish among the different tribes of Israel, and we have about five or six of them, to work together. There is, there is a lot more in common than meets the eye. I say it about the Israeli Arabs. And as I said about the ultra-Orthodox, I think with the right leadership and the right approach, we cannot solve all the problems, but we can actually find a much more united Israel that respects its pluralism, its richness and, and plurality, and, and the fact that we are different. I think it's, it's, it's a great reason for celebration and pride. And, but we have to find a way to do that. And yet, because of what I said here, 
because of the seventh threat. There is no time to lose. We are on thin ice, on very thin ice. So we must act quickly and in a smart and new way because this would not wait. Great. I know the Reverend is saying to himself, I thought there were 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> I actually have a question for you. Um, based on your knowledge and your background in the civil rights movement, in the, the history in the US, and there are so many other situations in the world where boycotts and divestment were being ca carried out or urged. When are strategies such as boycotts appropriate to consider and debate if people are concerned about the question of real justice? And this is saying in the context of you saying that you know this boycott actually would be something that's worth boycott after all of this careful look into that. Thank you. From, from our perspective, we have utilized boycotts, sanctions, divestment issues as it related specifically to tangible issue that you can look at in terms of unjust or immoral. I mentioned the, the 1955 bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. In that situation, Negroes, colored, whatever term they wanted to use for us back then, were not allowed to sit anywhere in the bus. We had to pay our fare in the front of the bus, just as white Americans, but get off the bus and go to the back of the bus and then find a seat in the section stated for colored only. Dr. King decided after Rosa Parks was arrested that our money spends just like white American money spends. And if we're gonna pay our fare, then we ought to have the right to sit anywhere as any paying customer. So they decided to boycott, as you know the story. The boycott proved effective and dismantled the entire bus system of Montgomery. That began a chain effect, a chain reaction, that brought about several civil rights victories in terms of the 1963 March on Washington, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, all starting back to that first bus, bus boycott. In the 1980s, the only time I've ever been arrested in my life, uh, and I do have, I have been arrested, was when I was demonstrating at the South African Consulate in Washington, D.C., because we were urging divestment from countries or from apartheid country South Africa, asking businesses and corporations do not do business with an apartheid regime because you are enslaving and denouncing the majority of the people here in South Africa. We felt, and most Americans and most around the world felt, if you apply the economic pressure to that country, South Africa, which it did, apartheid would come down in tall order, which it did. From my perspective, having dealt with the civil rights movement, if there are issues, if there are companies, if there are businesses that do human rights violations against people, whether you are black, white, Jewish, straight, gay, whatever, the bottom line is that there has to be a way, a mechanism in place to say we're no longer going to do business with you until you recognize us as citizens. So I think the BDS movement is a, is a sham, as I stated earlier, where it uses boycotts and divestments and sanctions under the guise of human rights, but as has been stated, it's really not dealing with human rights, it's dealing with one issue alone, and that is to stop or to destroy the state of Israel. And so for those persons who believe in nonviolence, I taught the six steps of Kingian nonviolence as taught by Dr. King, that you first of all gotta do your background, get your background on the whole situation, the conflict. You gotta then educate yourself to the problem Number three, you gotta personally commit yourself to the situation. Number four, you gotta negotiate with those who are oppressing you or those who have the power. Then after the fourth step of negotiation, if that fails, then you have the fifth step, which is direct action. That's where the boycotts, the demonstrations, all that comes. So it's really the fifth step of Kingian nonviolence. And after the uh, direct action, the sixth step and final step is reconciliation, where you then reconcile back with those who've oppressed you 
so that there are no winners, there are no losers. But you sit down together and recognize that we all won and we all must now work together. So for Dr. King and the movement, the, the boycotts and all those direct action movements really was the fifth step. There was four other steps that came before the direct action. Thank you very much. We're going to wrap this up with one last question, um, Mr. Shavit, because you, you already gave us um, a, a little bit about how we should really take some direct action and what we need to do to help fight this movement that, that has resulted in the boycotts and divestments and, and even the sanctions. Um, can you re reiterate that for us and just talk about what our community can do in the face of these movements? Again, in my really moving experiences over the last few months, I've become totally obsessed but also inspired by the Jews and non-Jews relating to Israel that I've seen throughout this country. And what I've seen, as I told you, is a great challenge of many people confused and lost. But I've seen so many young people that when you talk to them in a new way, in the right way, they are transformed very quickly, very quickly. The light is there, the candle is still burning. But in my mind, we have a limited amount of time to change our way. I will say this. I think that we are faced with the most dramatic decade we can imagine. Because as Jews, and talking of what you've talked about, the 50s and 60s, and where you've, your people have come and how our people have come, we must realize that as Jews, we never had it so good. Let anyone here think of his parents, great-parents, great-grandparents. What we achieved is incredible. But we are dramatically challenged. Dramatically challenged. So we must combine the following. A renewed new kind of love and respect for ourselves. A renewed sense of unity and mission and a brave, courageous way of opening our eyes and looking at the challenge, at the challenge facing us. The future is not guaranteed. The future is totally up to us. Let's, let's, let's act and let's rise to this great challenge in the way that our great people has risen to previous ones. Thank you very much. The only thing I would add to that, I know the hour is late, is the only thing I would add is let us also recreate that alliance that worked so well in the 50s and the 60s uh, in terms of the African-American community, the Jewish community, others, because... I firmly believe that as you were with us during the 50s and 60s, now it is our turn to be with you as you now fight against BDS. So let's work together in Seattle, the African American community and the Jewish community together. God bless you. On behalf of the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, the steering committee and our co-sponsors, I want to say thank you to Mr. Shavit and Reverend Flowers for their inspiring words this evening. I also want to thank all the community organizations that have been involved in making this event happen. This truly is a community event, one that highlights just how special our Jewish community is. I challenge you to find any other community that could have the depth and breadth of the sponsors to an event like this. I hope that you enjoyed this evening and look forward to many more as a community.